Hello everybody, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and today we're going to be looking at the tier list for uh, League of Legends, patch 915. And as always, you can find timestamps in the description if you don't have time to watch the whole video. And I'll have um, a link to this Google Doc as well in the description if you want to jump around. Now in this Google Doc, if you click on uh, any of these champions, it'll take you to a mini Google Doc, which will tell you uh, recommended runes, recommended items, and I have a five point rating system for each champion. One being the champion is one of the worst at whatever that task is. Five being the champion is one of the best at that task. And there's five different categories here. Lane pressure is how likely is the champion able to dominate the laning phase. Kill threat, how likely is the champion able to get a kill in the laning phase. Safety is how safe is the champion, particularly from ganks. Um, during the laning phase, scaling is how well does the champion perform over time. And reliability is how well um, or how likely is it that someone can perform well on this champion um, over a long period of time. So part of that is how difficult is the champion to play, but part of it is also how well does it fit into the meta? Are there a lot of common counter picks? So just how likely is it that if you put the time in, um, you're going to perform well on the champ? Okay, well, let's go ahead and get in here. A couple of shifts since last time, a little bit of a change in mentality. So a little bit of background on me, if you're not familiar with me. Um, you know, throughout, I've spent most of my time, you know, in low diamond, high platinum, um, this season, but just recently, like in July, I just kind of fell like a rock, like pretty much right before I went on vacation, or maybe it was right after I went on vacation with my family in early July. But these last few weeks have been pretty rough. I mean, we've been hanging out kind of low diamond, P4, P3, and I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on, like what's happening. And I know a lot of people kind of felt the same way. It just feels like even more of a circus than usual in solo queue. And it's hard to really put your finger on exactly what it is. And I had some theories last patch about what, what might be going on. Now, I don't think Season 9 in general has been, like, that bad. I know people, it's always in vogue to complain about seasons, but I think it's been fine overall. I mean, it felt fine for a while there, but it could also just be that I took such a dramatic step down in such a short period of time that I just kind of forgot, you know, what it was like to be around the CeeLo, and it was just more Fiesta than usual. But either way, I mean, I think my prognosis here is you need to be doing on most champions that I'm going to recommend here near the top, it needs to be something proactive. So you need to be going out and basically carrying. Like, you need, you just have to expect that your top laner and your mid laner are going to feed at least one of them, if not both of them. And so you're going to have to have some combination of really good sort of mid to late game playmaking potential to carry that, or you're going to have to have ultra lane dominance um, to win your lane so hard that it pretty much demoralizes the enemy team um, and gives you some wins that way. But, you know, this is why I'm really kind of knocking down even some of the champions that have a high win rate just a little bit, like Sona's down a bit and, um, you know, Janna's down a little bit just because I feel like they're just not proactive enough. And I've tried playing Janna um and i've got a lot of experience on Jana in the past and she's great at peeling and protecting and certain ad carries like jinx that she's really good with are very strong in general right now but i just feel like there are some games where i'm just sitting there watching the game you know where our mid laner and top laner feeds and um you know the ad carry is just not doing very well and i'm just you know trying to move around get my wards like play around different champions but i just don't have the tools to make plays happen so a lot of people i feel like in a lot of lanes are not playing as many playmaking champions. There definitely are some, but like if we look at, um, I guess we do we do have some up near the top. So like Lee Sin late game does have the potential for some playmaking. Jarvan of course is very good with the playmaking, but like Kane, Elise, Kha'Zix, um, Hecarim's still there, and Sejuani's still there. So there's still some of that for sure up near the top. But I feel like. Maybe there's just not as much as there has been in the past. I'm just not really sure. Like, I'm looking for answers for why it's so clowny lately. Um, I think part of the situation also, and then we'll get into the tier list in a second. I just want to go over sort of the meta here so you can understand my thinking on why I moved some of the stuff around on this patch. But it looks like a lot of the high pick rate stuff is not high win rate stuff. That's something that I definitely have noticed is that win rates have sort of dropped across the board on popular champions. So, like, if we look at top lane... Looks like Aatrox is the most popular right now. He's below 50%. Renekton's below 50. And then, like, these other champions are right around 50. So you're not seeing high win rate and high uh, pick rate champions. At least not in the top lane. And I feel like that's similar um, in a lot of lanes. So if we look at Lee Sin here, 
you know, most popular by far, 10% higher than second place. Everybody's playing Lee under 48%, right? And then Kane's like 50%. Jarvin's like 50, you know, Lisa's is 51. Kha'Zix is 50. And you might say to yourself, well, that's because they're very popular. So people that get auto filled are playing those champions. That is true. That is true. But I do think that in the past, there have been popular champions that also had high win rates. Um, I just feel like that's not the case here. Now, Ari is a little bit different, but she's even down from where she was. She was 54% um, a while ago, right? But, you know, you see, still seeing a lot of Yasuo, Zed. I see personally see a lot of Akali and Silas in my games. And part of this is in pro. I think a lot of the really popular top-end champions that have been meta for numerous patches now are very difficult to play. And I think a lot of amateur people are trying to play them. So like Silas, Akali are the two that jump out to me. But even Aatrox to an extent feels like he's always feeding in my games. Because um, people are trying to emulate the pro meta and it's a very high skill cap meta right now. <laughs> so I think that's problematic. Also, it's kind of the middle of the summer. So a lot of people probably aren't taking ranks too seriously right now. So, you know, maybe they're just experimenting and is trying out other stuff. Um, you know, Team Fight Tactics is out as well. So it's possible that a lot of the strategic meta minded people are playing Team Fight Tactics now. Someone suggested that on stream. I'm not sure if that's entirely true. But I'm just floating some stuff out there for you. A little bit of evidence. And this is one thing that I did notice. Look at 80 carries. You know, the top three are all under 50%, most popular ones. Um, but I have noticed that across the board, win rates are definitely down if we look at you know thresh pike yumi morgana all of those you know 50 percent or less pretty much um and even if you look at the very top end here right like the highest win rate support right now is Jana at 52 like two or three patches ago you would have seen like karma lux sona and Jana all over 53 and i think the first three that i mentioned were all over 54 so there were definitely like some very high quality like like big win champions but now it feels like it has equalized across the board which is really good for like riot's balance team you know they're pulling a lot of champions closer to 50 percent they're making a lot more stuff viable um but that means that like you're gonna have to carry a lot of people because people just are not going to be on those high win rate champions as much anymore because a lot of them have been nerfed so Anyways, let's go ahead and get in here. I don't want to spend too much on the exposition, but I just wanted to explain that, like, I feel like the meta is really weird right now, and it's hard for me, or just, like, people just feel like they're playing a lot worse than usual, and I was trying to figure out, like, what's up with that. I know, you know, there's always ways I can improve as well, but it just feels even more, like, Clown fiesta -y than usual. Um... But let's go ahead and get in here. So for this reason, I think that Rakan is number one right now. Now, I have been playing Rakan a lot. There have been a lot of top-end players that have also been playing Rakan a lot. If you look at some of the um, really high-end supports, usually there's some Rakan in that list. Um, if we go to leaderboards here. And I was just kind of looking at them to see what they're doing. Now, first of all, the very top-end, um, like top-10 challenger, are going to be... Oh, that's annoying. Um, it's four 80 carries, four junglers, and like two top laners, I think in the top 10, which is kind of annoying. Once we get down to Shady here is the first support at number 15, at least as of the making of this video, you know, he's got some Rakan in there. Um, you know, three of his top 10, like most played champs or like in the last 10 games are Rakan. So it's only matched by Lux. So he's pretty popular even in solo queue. Um... And then if we look at Zazel, um, he's also played like a, a little bit of Rakan too. Zazel plays quite a few different things, but his most played on the season is Rakan. Um, and then if we look at win rates on Rakan as well, they've gone up quite a bit. And it's sort of weird to see Rakan kind of even up this high, like in the top 10 win rate, because he's so difficult to play. But those changes to him a few patches ago really were very important for Solo Q. They gave him a, a lot more health and a lot more armor. I think they gave him some extra damage on his um, on his W. We can look at these changes here just really quickly. So I don't want to rehash everything. This is something that I've just kind of been sort of rediscovering, playing Rakan a lot more um, over the last couple of weeks. And this is a cool feature, too. If you go to the League Wiki, which I'm not sponsored by them or anything. It's just a cool site that I use. You can look at the patch history if you're wondering, well, why is this champion so popular right now? Like, what, what happened here? You can go back and look and see sort of what's been adding up. So this was the patch... 9.9 .9, where he gained 60 health base armor went up three 
Um, they did bring down his attack damage, but let's be real, you're not landing a ton of autos, only on all ends, typically. He got extra magic resist, which is good, and extra magic resist per level. So that's pretty important early against a lot of magic users, and most supports right now are going to be sort of your um, poke AP mages and your enchanters in the bot lane. Got faster grand entrance timings. So they um, buff that back. And then... Um, now, you can't flash for half a second while you do this, so for especially for pro play, that does make him a little bit weaker. Um, although, he's still been pretty good, I think, in pro. He's gone like 50-50, and like last week, he was the second most played support, so he's still pretty good in pro as well. But everyone thought this was going to be the end of him. It's kind of weird, um, but you can still make it work. So this, what this really does is this makes this a lot better for solo queue, for people that are trying to learn him. He's a lot more forgiving because you have more of these defensive stats. You have a faster grand entrance, which is so much better. Like, it helps out a ton. God, I really miss when it was 2,200. But anyways, that's progress back to 1,700. Um, so that's one thing that definitely has happened to him. And the meta's kind of changed around, too. You know, they've nerfed a lot of these other enchanters, especially some of these poke ones like Karma they've nerfed, Lux they've nerfed, Sona they've nerfed. So they've nerfed a lot of these champions out that could put a little bit more pressure on him in the early game. Um, so that's really handy. And there's been a, a new build that's been floating around with him that I want to just talk about here really quickly. Because it, it has definitely changed how my games have gone. Because I've been winning a lot more since I've started like really understanding this build and taking advantage of it a lot more. Um, so you still go Guardian, which is kind of the baseline for him, but... I've started going more of these kind of all-in runes early. I think that Bone Plating is very, very good if you play around it. They did buff Bone Plating um, fairly recently. If they hit all three of your Bone Plating stacks, that pretty much gives you 90 health because it has 30 base on the Bone Plating. Let me just pull up the runes here so I can show you guys some of this. Um, my secondary monitor over here. They buffed Bone Plating at some point. I think it was earlier in the season. Um... It was also on patch 9.9, .9, so a little while ago, but it's all kind of adding together with some of these other nerfs that they've put on other champions. Um, but that's 30 health, basically, every minute or so that you can trigger this, right? I think it's on a 45-second cooldown, yeah. So realistically, you know, once a minute, even if you don't get it perfectly, you get a free 90 health if you can force an all-in. And he's very good at forcing all-ins early on. So, you know, that's 90 health per time. If you're in lane for three minutes, that's an extra 270 health. That's 50% more health from where he starts um, at 540. So that's a lot of health if you learn how to trade with this correctly. Um, so bone plating is really good. Demolish has been the second one that I've been taking, which might seem kind of weird. And I used to not take Demolish because, uh, you know, he's so short range. I just didn't think you'd be able to go up and pressure a Demolish while they're standing there. And that's true. It's hard to do that. But if you can push them out of lane, if you can force them to get a bad back, this pretty much gives you a free extra plate and gives you extra priority on your back. So maybe you, you might normally have to stand there for two waves to get that tower plate if you don't have a cannon wave when you're pushing. But now you can actually get it like much faster back and then get back to lane one wave faster, which can be a really huge deal. It makes sure they don't counter push into you, helps you protect the dragon in case they see you leave lane and they want to try to pull a fast dragon. Um, it's just really, really nice. And even when you roam around, you know, you roam middle, you force a flash and force a back or get a kill or something, you can get a plate off of mid tower too. So it's just very, very useful for accelerating um, how fast you get those plates. And remember that plates are worth, um, I believe, I think it's 180. I forgot. It might, it might be 180 if you split it. But they're worth a lot um, of gold if you get those plates. So you really want to get them, and this really helps out a lot. Even later on in the game, it's useful, um, you know, for taking down some towers. So I really like that. Font of Life, some people take that. That's okay if you're going to go um, Ardent Sensor, which more people are getting right now, um, which we'll talk about the items here in a second that have kind of changed up. But more people are getting Ardent Sensor, but it's just really, really weak until you get Ardent Sensor. And so I don't like that one as much. Shield Bash is okay. I've tried this out. It does give you a little bit of extra damage for the all ends, um, for sure. Um, you know, maybe like that one extra attack is going to give you like maybe 10 extra damage early on, which does add up. It is nice. It does give you a bit of extra armor. But I think just having the potential to get those plates faster to really help you, you and your AD carry cash in on that gold, just a really big deal. Because if you even just get two plates off of the demolish, like it definitely pays for itself. Hundreds and hundreds of gold for um, a secondary rune. So. 
That's really nice. We talked about bone plating. Now, this one is a bit of a trickier one, revitalized versus unflinching. Usually, you don't want to take overgrowth because you're not going to be stacking a lot of health, so the 3.5% health is not going to matter as much. But revitalized is really good, and I do see a lot of people taking this. He does have very strong shields. People forget that about Rakan. They have nerfed a lot of the other shields over time. They just recently rebuffed him a couple of patches ago. But he still has some of the best shields in the game because um, they haven't really been nerfed. Um, so if he double shields somebody, that's a 280 shield with a 0.8 ratio, which I think is very nice. Um, so Revitalize is definitely pretty good on him. He also has his um, base shield here which is good, and then he gets some healing off of Gleaming Quill, and then if you get Redemption, I think that's really the um, the big deal. If you're going to get Redemption in your build, if you're going to go for kind of one of the classic Zeke's into Redemption builds, um, then I think it's definitely worth it to take Revitalize. So, that is nice. It doesn't do a lot in the early game. It's okay, especially if you're going to max shield, um, which is like some people are doing that. I used to do that. I I've gone away from that in favor of maxing W, which we'll talk about here in a second, but... Um, it can be okay. So if you're maxing shield or getting uh, redemption or both, really, if you're getting redemption, you probably need to be maxing your shield because you really want to maximize that plus 10% healing and shielding. So it's okay. Uh, it's not the best in the early game, but it's all right. Now, unflinching is something else that's pretty good. If they have a lot of CC, particularly, um, this can be pretty nice. So whenever you use your summoner spells, you gain 10% um, tenacity for each one on cooldown. Stacking twice up to 20%. So basically you get 20% tenacity, which is like two-thirds of a Mercury Tread. Which is nice. Now keep in mind that the other runes we're going to talk about here in a second, Legend of Tenacity, will also give you tenacity. And it scales multiplicatively, not additively. So if Legend of Tenacity gives you 30% and um, this gives you 20%, let's say that something was going to CC you for one second. If it was additively, then you do 30 plus 20 50, 50% 50 off, it would only be a 0.5 second stun. Not how it works, though. Okay, it's multiplicative. So first you take your 0.3, which is going to bring you down to 70, and then you take um, one-fifth of that, which is 14. So then it goes down to 56, and you only um, would be stunned for 0.56 seconds. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but it does add up a little bit. So getting extra tenacity is still very, very good. It's just not as good as it seems, and you can never get to some ridiculous number like you know, 70% tenacity, right? If you go like unflinching plus legend tenacity plus mercury treads or whatever, you're not going to get to 70. Like to where CC basically doesn't work on you. But it's still good. A lot of people still get this. With Recon, you really want to be using your summoners like all the time when they're off cooldown because you can force action. Because you can go in there, you know, start a fight, use your ignite every time it's off cooldown. And a lot of times you want to use your flash to try to make plays too. So your cooldowns are going to be down a lot. Um, with Recon specifically. And so I think that's what makes Unflinching pretty good because you can use all of them offensively. You don't have to wait and respond to the enemy. So Unflinching is something that I think is pretty good. Now the secondary runes, this one's kind of weird. This is something that just kind of snuck up, I think, in the last patch or two. Um, that's become more popular, but it is the Presence of Mind Legend Tenacity build. Now other champions have been running Presence of Mind on support Primarily Pike, and I think a lot of people started trying it out on Recon, and it's actually pretty good. So Presence of Mind um, gives you a 10% cooldown on your ultimate's uh, maximum cooldown. So that is pretty good, and this does allow you to break the 40%. So if you get 40% CDR, this can still go over that. So let's just say the cooldown on your ult is... 100 seconds just for easy number you have 40 percent cooldown that goes down to 60 and then every time you get a kill or an assist on somebody it'll lower it by an additional six so if you get two extra kills and assists in a team fight um it'll go down an additional 12 so it basically allows you to break the cdr cap and even in the early game if you just get one kill then it's 10 percent one kill or one assist that's the same thing as transcendence right on your ultimate now transcendence does affect your other runes as well and remember, Transcendence is kind of old school what people would get. You do like Nimbus Cloak Transcendence or Nimbus Cloak Celerity on Recon, And that's the most popular secondary a lot of people will do. Um, <clears throat> but you have to be level 10, which really is like 15 to 20 minutes into the game for Recon, Or like most supports, it takes a long time to get there. Games are closing out or are being snowballed a lot faster than that. There are some games literally where it's like 
Seven kills in seven minutes. A lot of games in the early game now. It's so clowny. But, anyways, this comes online immediately. It's there. And the 20% extra mana is actually very relevant, especially for all-ins early. You're not going to have a ton of mana regen, and your spells are kind of expensive. So if you go through, like, one rotation to get somebody down to, you know, 50% health, you all-in with your W, Q, auto-attack them, and then shield back. And then you do it again for your all-in, you're going to be really low on mana. And so this will allow you to get that little bit of extra mana so that you can maybe kill the other person before they run away. Or you can get away from that jungler um, if you're just maybe just barely able to trade a kill out of it. So I think it's pretty good, especially for the mid to late game where you can get multiple kills and assists pretty quickly. It really serves kind of the snowball meta where everyone's running around and constantly dying. You just want your ult up as much as possible. And this is ready to go immediately. You do not have to stack it up. So I've really liked Ulti Hunter in the past, which gives you 25% cooldown on your ult, which is very nice. But you do have to stack it up. And there's just not another good rune in this tree for him. Uh, Taste of Blood can be all right. Uh, that's probably what I would go if you did this as a secondary. But, you know, you do have to stack this one up. So these are both good. But the thing is, Legend Tenacity is going to be way better than Taste of Blood, I think. And this pretty much gives you 30% tenacity, which is going to allow you to go mobility boots early and still get the same tenacity as if you had gone Mercury Treads. So it saves you some gold with that. Mercs usually cost uh, 300 more than Mobies, and it gives you a lot more movement speed to respond to situations. Now, obviously, it's not going to have the magic resist that Mercs have, so you might have to get Mercs anyways if they have a lot of magic damage on their team, but... Um, it is very nice. This is something that a lot of people have been going towards. Um, and if you get takedowns, you basically get an extra 2.5% uh, tenacity. Now, you're not going to be getting... Um, you do get 20 points for a takedown on, like, a dragon. So if you get dragons, you do get some points off of that. Um, but this can take a little while to stack up. You know, once again, just like we were talking about with Ulti Hunter, that is bad. This is pretty much what everyone's doing now, though, and I think it's mostly because of Presence of Mind just comes online so early and um, just really allows you to, uh, you know, get some, get some more ultimates rolling quickly without having to rely on any additional stacking. So that's what I think is really good. I really wish with this tree they would break up these hunters because all of these are very good. So I wish they would just, like, rename some of these and just put them over here. Like, if they would just rename Ingenious Hunter, almost nobody gets that. But, like, just rename it and just put it in here for, like, Eyeball Collection. Like, I think these are a little too thematic. I don't know. Like, I would just like to see something like that in here. Or just, like, over here. Just somewhere. I think Ingenious just has so much potential. But the problem is, it's just, like, Relentless is so much better than it is most of the time, or Ultimate Hunter. I mean, maybe this would just make some champions OP if they could get two of these. I don't know. Anyways, that's something I wish they would do. <clears throat> but as far as um, runes go here, I think I'm going to say um, Mobies, and then we'll just kind of see from there. Let me pull up the items here real quick, and then we'll... Um, We'll move on to somebody else. I don't want to spend the whole thing talking about Recon. But I have kind of figured out a lot of... I've been trying a bunch of different combinations. And this is what I think is working for me. And it's becoming a lot closer to what a lot of the pros are doing over here. Is... Um, to the most popular combination is going to be this kind of new Guardian into Precision. There are still some people that are doing other stuff. You know, it's kind of situational. Recon is one of those types of champions where... It just really depends on your matchup and how you like to play him because he can be very defensive or offensive. But that's really common. And more and more people are going, like I said, towards more of these AP items rather than Redemption second. Zeke's is still very common, but Shirelius is coming back in for even more playmaking potential. Ardent Sensor's coming in. Part of that is because a lot of um, heavy attack speed, 80 carries are really good. And a lot of the top end players in Challenger are 80 carries right now. Like I said, four of the top 10 people in Challenger right now are 80 carry so it makes sense that you would go something like ardent sensor because it's going to buff up your jinx or your kaisa or whatever so they do more damage um the kind of curious one for me is that athene's unholy grail is actually sneaking in before shirelia's and redemption i haven't personally tried this but i can try it out maybe sometime soon the reasoning behind that i could maybe see is it allows you to get um Allows you to get an Amp Tome early for more AP, and he does, he scales pretty well with AP. I mean, his shield has extra AP on it, so that's going to give you more survivability. His Q will do more damage and heal for more, and then, um, of course, the shield that he gives out to your allies with the E has more 
um, it's going to be a lot bigger as well. So he has very good AP ratios. So maybe that's part of it. It does give you some mana regen also so that you can um, 50 or 100% mana regen. So you can try to go for those all-ins in lane a lot more. It does have 30 magic resist also. So if you're against an AP champion, it can be good. So it's just all around a really strong champion. And whenever you go in for that all-in damage, you're probably going to be doing two or 300 damage early. So that is going to give your shield an extra, you know, 100 or 200 um, shielding. So can be pretty good for all-ins early. And they did nerf Zeke's a while back. Zeke's is still very good. But remember that they did nerf it to... Um, Effectively, I believe like 15% on hit damage instead of 25%. Yeah, it's 30% over two seconds. And I believe you get about 50% of that like on hit every time. So it's like, yeah, you're giving, you know, if your AD has 100 AD, every time they attack, you're giving them like 15 extra on hit damage, which is really nice. The slow is also really good and underrated um, because it does allow you to stick close to people. And doing an extra, you know, 120 damage off of that slow as well, if you can just keep them close for like three seconds, is very nice. So don't underestimate it. Don't sleep on this item. It also gives you armor and magic resist. So if they have a lot of AD on their team, um, you know, like AD jungler, and then they have like a pike or a thrush bottom, it's still going to be really good. So it's still the most common item, but you are seeing a little bit more with the redemption. Now, I've personally been taking Knight's Vow a lot more lately. There are still some people that are getting that, although not as many. I don't know. Maybe I can try out some of these other things, but especially against heavy AD comps, it's just going to allow you to engage a lot more safely, and it's going to give that extra little bit of protection to your AD carry against assassins. So I tend to like Knight's Vow a little bit. Um, it also gains you, gives you extra movement speed when you run towards your partner, which is very relevant whenever you engage all in. One like real danger with Rakan is you might overstay and try to tag one too many people with your charm, but this is going to give you 15% extra movement speed to run back and then shield back to your AD carry. So that's something that I think a lot of people underestimate with him, but gives you nice armor for both you, um, gives you the armor, gives your ally the extra mitigation. Yes, you're only getting 6% off of it because you're considered range, but I still think that it's going to be pretty good. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm still recommending Zeke's Vow and then maybe Redemption. Although once again, try it out in your build, see what you think. Um, you know, try out the Athenes, try out the Ardent Sensor. Just remember, you're going to be like particularly squishy with Ardent. So you need to be very nimble and very careful if you're doing Ardent. Um, but if they have a low damage comp, like maybe they have Ezreal, Janna, Bottom, or something like that, maybe you can get away with that. Um, that's going to add a lot of extra scaling to your team. If you do know that you want to go Ardent, if you're looking at their team comp and you're just thinking, you know what, I'm going to go Ardent this game, you can consider going Font of Life instead of Demolish. Now, once again, I really like Demolish for what I just described. But Font of Life would allow you, when you engage, to have everyone on your team get the Ardent Sensor buff because the heal off of Font of Life counts as a heal from you, and that will trigger Ardent Sensor. So if you're looking at the comp, you know, in like after everyone's picked and you're like, you know what, I'm going Ardent this game. We have a Jinx. You know, I looked him up on Poor Professor. This is, you know, a 60% a win rate Jinx. I know we're going to have a strong laning phase. You know, I, I want to try to go for Ardent Sensor. Then you can maybe go over that Font of Life. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on. So, Rakan, I just think he's so good for the mention or for uh, what we mentioned earlier, where you just kind of rotate around the map. You can make a lot of plays. He has pretty flexible runes and items depending on what's going on. You know, if your AD carry is really fed, you can do that ardent sensor. If you need more protection from assassins, you know, you can go for the Zeke's plus Knight's Vow. If they don't have a lot of AD or they just have AP and you're really far ahead early, you can go for Athenes. If your team needs more engage, you got a bunch of meatballs on your team. You know, you got Olaf and then top lane. You got Darius or something like that. And you just want to boost everyone in there for the fight. You can go Shirelia's. You got a team fight comp. Uh, you know, you can still go Redemption. It'll be good. So he's just so flexible. He's got really good engage. And he has really good trade potential early if you take Frostfang, which I'm recommending again. Just every time that your Guardian or your Bone Plating are up, just go in with the with your W. Try to start a fight whenever the enemy AD carry is last hitting. You just go in, hit him with the W, auto attack him, Q him, and then just go right back um, to your AD carry. Unless they're pretty low. If they're pretty low, like if you get them down to like 40% or less, you can go ahead and pop Ignite and just keep um, auto attacking them if your AD carry jumps in. And usually you can force a flash or a heal out of them. And it's a really good trade. If you force them to heal while they're ignited, then they're only getting half value on the heal and your Ignite's on a lower cooldown. 
So a lot of Rakan is like, he has so many tools with these runes and with his abilities. You just have to use them all efficiently. Like every time it's up, every time Bone Plating's up, you're going in. Every time Guardian's up, you're going in. Every time your Ignite's up, you're going to try to force that heal or that flash off of them. And then that allows you to exert more pressure and get some of those plates with Demolish early. So I think he definitely does have the potential. Now you will see a lot of people going like three points of Q. I wouldn't do that unless you're Challenger because 80 carries just... And like Platinum and Lower, they just don't know how to trade most of the time. They're not going to do light trades. It's all in or nothing. And so that's why I like going Frostfang and going for like W Max first. And you are seeing some pros go for this W Max. I know I got asked about this. Well, every you know, someone was like, well, everybody's going, you know, Q Max. Why don't you do Q Max? Well, the thing is, a lot of pros are moving away from that too. There are still some. But if you look at Zazel in this game, he was going W Max right um and, and he did very well in that game as 2-4 and 24. <clears throat> now part of that's because he had Zaya with him so he knew he could go aggressive but i'm telling you if you force a lot of all ends i've gone back to the w you know this used to be the standard a long time ago and i forgot just how much i missed this because it really allows you to force fights like if you you know if you get three points in this in the laning phase it's a 15 second cooldown you know you go in with your dash and, like, the enemy uses one of their, um, you know, cooldowns to try to get away. You know, they jump away with Tristana or, um, you know, you can get the, the Thresh to try to throw his hook to hit you or whatever. Like, you can force their cooldowns and then you're going to have a lower cooldown by three seconds. And I'll give you, like, three, a three-second longer window to try to go in and make another play before their stuff is off cooldown again. So, it doesn't sound like a lot, but these little windows add up for opportunities to make plays. And that's going to give you, like, more often you can trigger those Frostfang stacks. It's going to give you more flexibility with, with when you're trying to trigger those Bone Plating or just all of these other things. And it does similar all-in damage. All right, if we look at Rakan, the Q at level 3 is doing 160. The W at level 3 is doing 170. So it's very, very similar damage. And the big perk for me is, like, in the mid-game, you can actually use Grand Entrance to rotate around the map faster and still have it up for the fight. Because there are so many times where you just want to jump over a wall to get to a fight, you know, maybe three seconds faster, which could make a difference. But if you use your W there, if you're not maxing your W, then it's going to be on cooldown when you show up at the fight, and you're not going to have an important piece of CC. So I think it's really nice that you can use that grand entrance, jump over a wall, and then rotate, get to that fight, and your grand entrance is going to be up a lot faster, especially when you have all of the CDR. So that's what I like. It's similar all-in damage to your Q. Um, it does have a little bit more damage on it. it does have a bigger AP ratio, but the big thing is that it gives you mobility to get there, and you're going to have your CD, um, CDR when you finally show up. Or just things like using your W to jump into the enemy jungle to try to get around wards or something, Place like to try to get around their tribush ward. If you're on red side, just coming in through dragon pit, jumping over, like dropping a couple of wards down, you know, near their uh, red buff, near their raptors, and then getting right back out with your W, you know, maybe seven seconds later or something like that. It just it's so handy to be able to do that. It's kind of the same reason with Zaya or Zyra that I recommend maxing plant second, is it just gives you so much more flexibility with your vision and just how you're playing the game. But anyways, okay, enough about Rakan. Let's go in. But yeah, I do think that Rakan is really strong. He does take a little while to learn. But I think that right now is a great meta just because it's so Clown Fiesta. It's just so up in the open. You just don't know what's going to happen, right? Is your mid laner going to go 10-0? Is their mid laner going to go 10-0? We have no clue. Um, so it's really good if you're ahead or if you're behind and you can play around anybody. You have really good vis You have really good itemization options to do that have really good rotations to do that. You personally can make the plays if no one on your team makes a playmaker or, like, drafts a playmaker. If you've got, like, a Kali top and then you've got, like, um, I don't know, just any, like, a Zed metal and then you've got, like, a Kane jungle or whatever, this is going to give you that piece of CC to help out with that. So <clears throat> I think that makes him the most flexible one right now. And I think flexibility is king in a meta that's this um, turbulent. There's just much chaos going on right now. Okay, so Nami is the other one that um, I kind of put near the top of the list. Now, I like Nami a lot because um, she has, like, pretty good enchanter scaling, but kind of like Rakan, she's just really good at the Fiesta. You know, she, um, she's got really good ranges on her spells, and this is something that I talk about a lot, that a lot of other enchanters don't have. Some of them will have it. Like, Janna's got good ranges on her spells, too, but... Um, 
you know, this is 725 and you can bounce it off of an ally and still hit an enemy with it. You know, your Aqua Prison's 875, Tide Caller's 800. You know, this is almost 3,000. So you have really, really good range on your spells. And what that means is you're not going to be, like, close to a lot of action. So you can try to save people that are in dangerous situations and maybe still escape with your life. Versus someone like Soraka or Sona, if you're trying to get up close to heal and shield them, or even Lulu a little bit, then you might get caught out and killed because they're going to have less range. And it doesn't sound like a lot. Okay, you know, what's the difference between, like, a Lulu 650 range on her shield and... You know, Nami's 725 on our W. It's a really big difference. 100 range makes a big, big difference. So that's one thing that I like about her. She also has some of the best trading in the game that's very simple. It's very reliable. You just walk up W people if you can. Try to get an auto in there as well. And you can just rinse and repeat this over and over again. So it's just really, really good poke um, in the laning phase. Scales really well as the game goes on. And she has a lot of CC that a lot of other enchanters don't have. So like Aqua Prison... 1.5 second stun, very nice, goes over minions, you can hit it anytime, anywhere, you can hit multiple targets, I've seen triple bubbles, I've seen quad bubbles in team fights before, usually you're only going to get one or two, but it's on the table if everyone's clumped up, very good with things like Jarvan, where he can dunk multiple people, and Jarvan's very popular and very strong right now, so... There's definitely possibilities with that. And then a uh, really long-range tidal wave is very nice for knocking out, like, Jin out of his ult, knocking Xerath out of his ult, just following up on hard engages that your tanks might have when maybe you can't get there fast enough. So if Jarvan's just running ahead of your team or if Hecarim's running ahead of your team, you can just throw that tidal wave in there. Now, it's very slow, so you have to get used to throwing it. So you don't just want to throw it open field by itself or people are just going to dodge it. But... If they've already used their movement, if you've already hit your bubble, or if someone else has already hit their stuff, um, then Tidal Wave can be pretty good. It's on a pretty short cooldown. So, And she controls movement very well, too. So this um, this surge right here is very nice. You're often going to get at least 100 AP, between 100 to 200 AP. So it's going to give you 80 to 100 bonus movement speed on somebody for one and a half seconds. That's very nice movement speed. And then whenever this is like bouncing around on multiple targets, your ebb and flow is bouncing around or your tidal wave is going through your allies and the enemies. Don't forget if your allies get hit by your tidal wave, it doesn't do damage to them, obviously, but it does double their movement speed. So you actually get, you know, closer to like 150 to 200 movement speed off of this. Um, so that's a lot of speed to help out on engages. So she's got a lot of tools in her kit. She has more hard CC than a lot of other enchanters. So... I think that positions her really well, and she just has, like, nice stats, too. You know, um, she's got 11.5 mana regen. She has 335 movement speed. Um, so, and the range, like I said, is really, really nice. 550 attack range, good range on her spells. So that's pretty good. Now, I would probably go airy, mana flow, absolute focus, and scorch. I like absolute focus over transcendence. I get asked that a lot, but um, absolute focus, because you heal yourself off of just one spell off of your W versus someone like you know, Soraka, where you, I guess you do heal yourself off of Qs with Soraka, um, but like Sona is another popular enchanter in the bot lane. You have to use two different spells, your Q and your W, so you can't heal yourself as often or you'll just run out of mana before you get a lot of fairy charms. Um, but with Nami, you can. So Absolute Focus is a really good one. On Soraka, similarly though, like you probably don't want to run Absolute Focus because you injure yourself whenever you press your W. Um, but that's just a nice perk of her. And then footwear and biscuits. Biscuits just help you out with your mana early. It gives you some health, obviously, as well. But a lot of it's for that mana before you get a lot of fairy charms. Your first couple of packs is pretty nice. And then footwear, you don't need boots early. It's nice. It's a luxury. But you can hold out and save that money to get something like an Athenes or an Ardent Sensor faster. And get that little bit of extra movement speed um, in the early to mid game. So... I would probably just go Footwear Biscuits. It's also possible that you could go something like Bone Plating Revitalize if you're against an all-in lane. That can be pretty good, too. And then recommended items, Mobility Boots, Frost Fang. I think Athenes is what I would rush most of the time, unless your AD carry is really fed. Just because um, it's just a more well-rounded item to start with. It gives you some magic resist. It you know gives you 100% mana regen, which is really nice. Um, gives you some really nice trading, gives you a good chunk of AP early, and also increases your healing to allies. So it's just kind of everything you would want in a starting item. And then every time you get uh, a fairy charm after that, which all of your items build out of fairy charms, you get an extra 5 AP off of the Athene's passive. So I think it's just a really good one to start with, and it scales very well with the rest of your items later on. Now, Ardent 
is good, you know, obviously, but remember that Ardent scales per level. Like, you're doing more on-hit damage, you're giving out more attack speed, um, and your AD carry and other people are going to have more items that are going to scale better with attack speed as the game goes on. So, I would probably go Ardent second, although if your AD carry is um, someone who really benefits heavily from attack speed, you know, maybe like a Vayne who's 3-0, and and she just completed her Blade of the Ruin King, and you've got a choice whether you want Athenes or Ardent, maybe you can go Ardent in that situation. But I think Athenes is probably where you want to start, and then Ardent, and then Redemption. You could also do something like a, a Mikhail's instead of a Redemption if they have a lot of CC, but these would probably be the three items that you want to go. If you have a lot of split pushers on your team and they have a brain and you can use redemption to help influence fights in those side lanes to like turn the 1v1, then you can also get redemption maybe seconds like Athenes and then redemption could work. Or if your team has um, really heavy all in or um, really heavy team fight uh, champions, like you've got an Amumu on your team plus Jarvan plus Rumble or something like that, then you might want to go redemption second. So it just kind of depends on what you're doing. But these are definitely be the three items. It just. You know, you kind of have to figure out the order to buy them in, but I think Athens is a great place to start and then feel it out from there. Okay, so Nami, still very good, very versatile, good at the Clown Fiesta, has great ranges, has CC, has really good trading early, just kind of a jack of all trades, so that's why I like her um, over some of the other enchanters. And some of that is supported by her win rate, too. Only Janna is higher than her right now, um, <laughs> which we'll talk about Janna here in a second as far as like enchanters go, but. Um, I still like Nami. Now, I am more familiar with Nami. I have more games on her. But I just feel like she is a little bit more versatile than some of the other ones. Not in terms of itemization, but just in terms of playstyle, because you have the CC and the pressure early, and then you have some moderate scaling, although not as much scaling as something like Janna or Soraka later. But still pretty good. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about Pike here next. Now, Pike is someone that I kind of underestimated on the last patch. I kind of missed the... Uh, missed that little line or underestimated the line in the patch notes that said that he's basically going to be getting double money, um, which is pretty important. And someone pointed that out to me. Do you think that he's really OP or not? So basically what they did with Pike last patch, they didn't do anything this patch, but people were kind of like playing in this narrative a bit more as the patch unfolded. 50% damage to people who aren't executed. So if they get that heal off, like right when you're about to ult him, it feels terrible. You don't do any damage unless you actually kill him. Um, but you gain your cut whenever you kill an enemy with it. And um, if an ally kills an enemy while inside the X, now gains two stacks. Okay. Um, so basically, like in every situation, you're giving out an extra your cut, which is... Um, oh, I didn't realize it was even based on kill bounty. Increased by 100 gold on first blood. Okay, I never actually I haven't read that in a while. Um, but basically, this is where you get like half gold, pretty much. Um, so you're getting, you know, usually like it says 100 to 300 gold assist gold. So you're getting an extra assist. So normally, um, with Pike, whenever you kill somebody, um, you're getting the full uh, kill gold, I believe. Now I'd have to read this. New effect gains your cut. Okay, yes. So that goes to you. So you're the one who gets, so the um, your ally, your AD carry never gets extra gold off of this, but you do. So if you kill somebody with your cut, typically what would happen is you would get 300 gold. Your ally is going to get an assist for 150 gold. And then, and then they also get a your cut, which is this amount here, which is probably going to average, you know, about 150. So it's basically like you get two assists on it. So instead of just getting a total of 450 gold off of that, you get 600 gold. She's screeching. You get 600 gold. Now you're going to get an extra 150 off of that. So now you're going to get 750 gold. So it's almost like 25% more gold from what you were doing beforehand. So now you're going to get 450, and your ally is going to get 300. They're going to get the assist, and then they're going to get the your cut for 150, and you're going to get the cut for 150. So it's a lot of extra gold for Pike if you're consistently getting kills with your ult. But you have to make sure you're getting those kills in the resets with your ult. So it's a bit more skill dependent, but... You're winning a lot more here. And now, if you are, like, about to kill somebody with your X and an ally kills them instead, if they're in the X, um, then you get two bags of your cut. So you're going to get an assist for the 150, and then you're going to get two bags for an additional 150 each for 450 gold. 
So basically, Pike, anytime he kills somebody or gets an assist where he would get a York cut where they're, where he's trying to ult him and they die, um, then he's getting 150 extra gold, pretty much. So that is really nice. And for reasons similar to what I just described with Rakan a little bit ago, he's just great at Fiestas. Um, you know, people are going to be getting low. He can just sneak up, get these kills, snowball pretty hard. He can get... You know, he can go invisible. He can get around wards really quickly. He's very fast. I think they increased his movement speed on his W a while ago. Yeah, he got to increase movement speed to 40% um, at all ranks. I guess that was kind of a nerf on his W. So they're wanting you to... Um... Oh, no, 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 no. It scales. Okay, so they want him to put more points in W. So you can, if you want to, get faster movement speed on Ghostwater Dive. I haven't played Pike in a little bit, so I'm not sure what people max, but that is something that you could get second, potentially. Now, they did nerf um, solo lane Pike a lot with, like, how he interacts with minions, which doesn't matter as much. They did nerf his individual, like, standalone damage when you stab somebody with Bone Skewer. Um, they did lower the cooldown down to 14 seconds, which is nice, and they did reduce it again down to 12 seconds. That's a really low cooldown hook early. Um, you think about, like, a Blitz hook, I think, is, like, 20 seconds or something like that. Thresh is also, like, 20. His is 12. So that is pretty nice. So they did nerf Solo Lane Pike, but they've given a lot of buffs um, to support Pike quite a bit. So maybe I could try him out again um, some point soon. But he has a lot of base health early. Now, he can't get a ton of health later, um, and people don't build tank on him anymore. But he has 45 armor, 600 health, and he heals a lot in the early game off of his passive they still haven't nerfed this and if you get more ad then he heals a ton off of ad so you just want to go like full ad with him um you know dust blade ghost blade edge of night uh they had his w scale with um lethality as well and i believe his ult also scales with lethality so you really just want to stack a bunch of lethality items uh, but yeah i mean he has a lot of tools similar to recon he can get around the map pretty fast so with phantom undertow you never get a lower cooldown on it um, but you can jump over walls, you know, you can actually go invisible and get around wards to go deep into their, um, enemy territory and, uh, you know, get some sneaky wards in there, which can be very handy. And that allows your jungler to track their jungler better, allows you to make better decisions on when you should go aggressive or not. And you just snowball super hard. You get a ton of extra gold. You contribute to the offense, um, which is really good. So he's got a lot of stuff going for him. The one thing with Rakan is he is pretty skill shot dependent. You need to be able to land your hook. I guess you can, you know, do your E and then flash stun people if you have a hard time landing the hook, which is nice. Um, very good with a lot of aggressive kill lanes like with Draven or Jin in the early game. Uh, one of the best at roaming around the map, right? Because not only is he fast, but he's invisible. He gets around those wards. So you can go if they have an immobile mid laner. You know, they have a, um, like a Diana mid or a, a, um, a Kali mid or, you know, Irelia. Irelia is mobile, but she can have a hard time escaping if you, if, um, you can bait her into committing to a fight. So there's lots and lots of opportunities to carry. He's great at running around, picking up a bunch of these kills, generating extra gold for your team. So he's just awesome with the clown fiesta going on right now. And so with Aftershock, you turn into a pretty tanky beast early on. You got Demolish when you force those bad backs. Conditioning can be good. You can also go Bone Plating if you want to. Um, and then Presence of Mind and Legend Tenacity is what's really popular. Coup de Gras had been popular, but because you're doing true damage off of your ult, um, or you're just not even doing true damage, you're just executing people off of your ult, um, then Coup de Gras has no interaction with that. So, And they've nerfed it. So I think that Legend Tenacity is a little bit better. So you just want to go uh, Mobility Boots, Targon, and then Rush, Ghost Blade, Dust Blade edge of night um so yeah i think he is really good i did underestimate him last patch uh just how much extra gold you do get off of that <coughs> he is pretty good against enchanters you know if you land that hook on janna it's going to be really tough like yeah she can maybe use her ult to get away from you but it's still going to be a tough situation for her because the thing is whenever you bone skewer her while she's in the air you can go ahead and ghost water dot or um phantom undertow and she doesn't have an opportunity to tornado you out of that when she's already in midair so she's gonna have to um even if she like ults to try to blow you back because you're already going to be on the other side of her um you're probably still going to hit her with the phantom undertow and interrupt her ult so it's a really really good matchup into janna um, at least in the early game, if you can land those hooks on her. So that is pretty nice. Um, and similar, like, yeah, he just snares those enchanters hardcore, and he's got a really low cooldown on that stuff as well. So 
He's very, very good right now. He can have a harder time against tanks if he doesn't get him within execute range. It is also dangerous for him to go in, you know, because if he uses his Phantom Undertow and he gets CC'd and caught, he's going to die probably. He does get, um, he does get Aftershock, which is pretty nice, but, you know, he's not going to have that old school, like, Frozen Heart build, which made him really tanky and, like, Spirit Visage and difficult to kill. So you got to be careful with some of these engages a bit more than you have been in the past, but if you practice him, um, there are a lot of squishy champions right now. Tanks are still not that popular in the meta, um, especially solo queue. If you look at, like, the most popular supports right now, almost none of them are tanks. You see the Malachi, you know, 0.3% play rate. No one's playing that hardly. Um, but about as tanky as it's going to get is Blitzcrank, you know, in your top 10 or 15 champions. Leona is not being played as much. People aren't playing Nautilus as much as they used to. And it's not like you can't win against those champions. It's just harder. But yeah, a lot of really squishy champs in here. Now, champions like Zillion are going to be very frustrating to play against. Um, but outside of that, I think you've got pretty good matchups into a lot of champions. So I think he's really good. If you want to try him out, give him a whirl. You know, like I said, I did underestimate him last patch. Now, that being said, I hate that transition. But given that information, um, he still doesn't have an amazing win rate, right? He's still only got a 50% win rate. So, yes, in theory, he is very strong. He has played a lot, but he's not converting. And I think a lot of it is people are just being um, just too aggressive with him. They aren't timing their aggression uh, enough. So he does have the potential, but realistically, most people don't win a lot. But it's there. The potential is there. So if you want to practice him and get better, I think this is one of the best patches in a while for Pike. Okay. Uh, and we got to go a bit faster here. I spent a long time talking about Rakan and Pike, but I, I think that those are two that have kind of come up over the last few patches um, that I'm just talking about. Speaking of coming up here, we got Bard for the first time in my Tier 1, and I think it's just impossible to ignore him. I mean, he's the, the number two highest win rate champion right now with a really reasonable play rate. It's 5%. So that's a lot of, uh, you know, pick rate here. You know, before, I've always been like, you know what? He's really good, but he's only for specialists. You know, you only play him in very specific circumstances. But, you know, he does have a high play rate right now, and he's got the second highest win rate. So it's just tough to ignore that. So why is that? Why is he being played more? Why is he being picked more? Well, I think part of it's similar to what I just described as Pike. You've got a lot of fairly immobile enchanters that are being picked up, um, and he can bully them out early. You know, if he lands a stun off of his Q early on, and then later on if he lands an ult on somebody... Um, then he's going to kill him, probably. He does a lot of damage early on, a lot more than people suspect, especially when he takes Electrocute, which is pretty standard um, on him these days. He does a lot, and he can roam around. He's very fast. He grabs those meeps, so he puts out a lot of pressure, and he puts out a lot of roam pressure, too. So similar to Pike and Rakan, he can get in the enemy jungle, place down some of those wards, snowball harder. You can roam with your jungler. Yeah, You can present very good gank opportunities for your jungler over the wall, especially if you're on, like, red side. Um, I'm not going to pull out the map right now, but if you're on red side, so that's like top side, and you put a red ward in your tri-bush, right on the edge of that tri-bush, you can clear out any of the wards that might be along that wall, and then it's so easy if the lane's pushing into you, if they're trying to punish your AD carry, just to use your uh, magical journey just to jump right through that wall with your jungler and make some kills. So um, let me just, I'll just look at it real quick here. I know we're almost out of time. I don't know if this still works or not but um okay so this is what i was talking about here so you can just put your ward like right here put a little pink ward right here and then um that should see everything like right here so this should be cleared out so they're not going to have any wards here let's say that their team is like right here you know pushed up they're trying to pressure your ad carry into the tower they just won't go away they can think you're out here getting some charms, and you can just come right through here, you know, with your magical journey, and that's a very easy way to get some kills with your jungler. So it opens up some fresh paths for your jungler to get some kills as well. You could do something similar on a uh, blue side. You know, you can clear out the ward right here. You know, you just have your pink ward here. They're pushed up. You can come through, like, right here with your jungler. So you can do it on both sides. I think it's a little bit, a little bit better, a little bit less expected on red side. But it can definitely work on blue side as well if you've got control of these bushes, right? So this is a little bit harder to control if they're pushing you in a tower the whole time. But you can do it. This is easy. Almost no one's going to be able to come up and clear out this pink ward. So it's very easy on this side. But yeah, he just opens up gank pass early on for your jungler. Um, he's very aggressive. 
his itemization is a little weird. I thought more people might be going for things like uh, the ghosts with him, but it looks like everyone's going redemption still with him. But I think it's just the meta right now is just much more early game focused, or it feels like that with a lot of champions, and just playmaking. Like, can you roam around? Can you make plays? How do you do in a clown fiesta? You know, he's going to do excellent. So he's very similar to Pike, to Rakan in that sense. Um, you know, and once you learn him, he does have some really nifty things he can do. You know, that ultimate can shut up like a, a Zerath that's trying to ult or a Jin that's trying to ult. It can stop people from dying to Karthas. It can stop people who are about to die to Kane. Um, any of these kind of delayed, like Fizz ults, anything that's like a delayed um, delayed damage, you can help prevent that with your ult. So you have a lot of playmaking potential. Recently they did, um, I think maybe a few patches ago, they did buff his ult. They lowered the cooldown on it, which is very nice. And they did standardize his E so that you always get um, really good movement speed out of it, so you don't have to put points into it anymore. So you can put points in your W, which gives you better laning phase, um, so it's going to give you more healing. So I think he's pretty good. He's a playmaking champ. He's one of the hardest champs to play. I think he's right there with um, Thresh, just because he's so weird. You have to learn his combos. You have to learn how to look for those stuns with Cosmic Binding. You have to learn when you should use your ult appropriately and when not to use it, because you can either like make or break entire games based on that ult. Right, Rory? What are you doing? Are you awake and you just don't know what's going on? Yeah, good job. You want to put on the glasses? You want to put them on? Are they fun? She says no to the glasses. Uh, you you want to put them on me? Okay, we only have a few minutes left here. I do want to make sure I cover the top five, and then it's a couple words on the last couple wins. Oh, we both got them on. Good job, Rory. Yeah. She says, I'll put them on if you do. Yeah, I'll put them on if you do. Um, yeah, just Electrocute, Cheap Shot, Zombie Ward, um, Ingenious Hunter. I think people are actually going Eyeball Collection now. I haven't updated this page in a little bit. Um, but it's pretty, It's a lot of s similar things. Um, I'll look up the secondaries. Like, Click on it and check it. I forgot to update this because I haven't had Bard on my top 10 for like probably a year. I don't think it's water walking and celerity anymore. Oh, it's um, I remember what it is. It's uh, relentless hunter. I think uh, taste of blood and relentless hunter. And then I think a lot. Of, it's kind of up in the air, but I feel like a lot of people are doing uh, redemption, and then um, twin shadows for the ghosts. Okay, but yeah, that's Bard. Still gonna be very strong on this patch. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, so I just want to hit the last couple here. Sona, still going to be good. Has a lot of great trading early on in the laning phase. Going to build her similar to Nami and a lot of the other enchanters. You're going to be getting Athene's Unholy Grail, um, and then um, Ardent Sensor after that, and then Redemption after that. Has a lot of good trading early on, uh, but she did get nerfed her ratio a little bit. Uh, so she doesn't scale quite as well with her Q, but still very good. She's just really vulnerable to all enchants, particularly like Pike, Bard, Rakan. Um, those matchups can be pretty rough for her, but I still think she's the number one scaler. Team fighting is kind of coming back in in some comps. If you have a comp where you're going to be able to do some 5v5s, she scales better than anyone. If you get two or three items, you win the game, basically. If you can just not die, and if your team doesn't like hard throw and actually does 5v5 fights, you're going to win. So, she still is very good in those types of comps, especially if you have a lot of tanks. Zyra, still strong. Stepped her down just a little bit because it, the Fiestas are kind of hard on her late game. You can bush people and get some easy kills, but at the same time, you can get caught out while you're trying to ward, buy a bunch of assassins, you know, your Zeds, your Talons, Akalis, all that stuff can catch you out and kill you in the late game. So, I still think she's probably the best overall AP champion that you can play, but she can also be somewhat vulnerable to things like Pike and Rakan. Um... If you don't land your E, they can flash your E and kill you in the laning phase. So, still can be very good. Applies that early pressure, but kind of tougher in the Fiesta. Also has a tough matchup in Lux and Zerath and Velkos, and all of those are becoming a bit more popular right now. So, still very strong. Still the best overall AP, but just a little bit weaker than she has been in the past just because of meta shifts. Lux, still very good. Still very scary. Has received several nerfs. Um... Can be pretty weak to some of these all-in engaged champs if you don't hit your Q, similar to Zyra, if they flash it or they dodge it or whatever, or you just miss it and they go on you. Uh, but she still scales pretty well, still going to be pretty good um, in the early game. But once again, very vulnerable, doesn't have any escapes. 
Uh, Janna, number one win rate right now, still very strong. Definitely an argument that she should be tier one for sure, but at the same time, she has limited playmaking capabilities. You can really just walk up in W, which is very dangerous later on. But if you have a very good AD carry that you trust, you know, a Jinx or a Twitch, who you look them up on Poor Professor, they've got a lot of wins. She can be very good. It's super difficult to engage into a Janna, so she's good against the enemy engage, but she can't really make plays for herself. So if you have playmakers on your team and you trust them, and you know you have a really good um, hyper carry you can peel, she can be very good, but otherwise that can be a little bit rough. Soraka did get some buffs on this patch. She can be really good if you land a lot of your Qs, but it's still the same old problems. If they get Grievous Wounds, it's going to be rough, and if they camp you a lot early on, it's going to be rough, but otherwise can be good. Anyways, that's going to be it. Have a good day. See you next time.